welcome to episode 22 of Thin Air Podcast. Since our launch in January of 2016, we have learned and grown so much. Today's episode, episode 22, marks a departure for us. We are no longer going to use a seasonal model with season breaks. Because of our continued support from you, our amazing listeners, we will now publish episodes every two weeks and continue to do so without what felt to us like a somewhat arbitrary season. So what does this mean for you? It means more episodes of our podcast, no large gaps between episodes, and we won't be referring to seasons going forward. The release of today's episode also coincides with a new launch of our Patreon. Over at patreon.com slash thin air podcast, we now have rewards for our Patreon subscribers, including copies of episode transcripts, early access to new episodes, and we are so, so excited about this, Patreon only mini episodes, which will be released between our regularly scheduled content. Head on over to patreon.com slash thin air podcast to check it out. And if you're already a Patreon subscriber, get ready for some goodies headed your way. Your support has meant so much to us from the very beginning, and we're so, so excited to offer these rewards. So thanks again. And now here's Daniel. This episode of Thin Air is brought to you by Blue Apron. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash thin air. You will love getting fresh ingredients delivered right to your door. Redeem your three free meal offer today by going to blueapron.com slash thin air. I got home and the day after I got home, I got a call from David's mom. And she says, have you seen, have you seen David? And that was it. That was the moment. Like that was the, it was the worst moment. One of the worst moments of my life right there. In early August 2004, 24-year-old American David Snedden set out on a journey. It was nothing new for him. In fact, it would be easy to call David an explorer. In April of that year, he had arrived in Beijing, China to complete a summer program studying the Chinese language at the University of International Relations. The program was intended to help him complete his undergraduate requirements at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. David had been planning a trip through China during the summer after classes had ended with his roommate and friend, a fellow American student named George Bailey. On August 5, 2004, the two of them left their belongings with a friend in Beijing and set off together for a brief trip around southern China. The last time anyone would ever hear from David would only be six days later, on August 11th. David Snedden has been missing ever since. We started by taking a train, uh, what's called a a hard sleeper or something like that, Uh, a hard sleeper to uh, Guangxi province, to a place called Guilin. And Guilin is this fantastic <laughs> natural spot where you've got these Dr. Seuss-like mountains, green, lush, everything. If you've ever seen Star Wars, uh, The Revenge of the Sith, the scene where uh, Chewbacca and his folk are fighting the whatever, the Empire, whatever it's called by then. I didn't really like the movie. Anyhow. If you ever see that scene, that's it, that's Goyling, uh, literally. I mean, that's where they filmed it. That's George Bailey, David's roommate, travel companion, and the last person who knows him to see him before he goes missing. George was a fellow student at BYU, and the two were friends before going to China. We started as roommates in around August or September of 2003. And from uh, that time until December of 2003, we were roommates in the summer of 2004 is when I flew out to China and he had already secured an apartment by then. And it was the summer of 2004 that he disappeared. So um, I flew out in July. Uh, We spent the entire month of July and then the first week of August together. So if you had to describe, would you say you guys were friends or best friends or how would you describe your relationship with him? Yeah, David and I were friends. I, I wouldn't say that we were you know, best buddies in the world, but we were the types of friends where it was like, you know, I got to know this guy and I thought, He's just really fun. I like him a lot. Uh, really enjoy being around him. 
Um, we connected. We never had fights. Uh, we talked a lot, and I don't think we ever really got bored of each other. We just had, you know, good times. He's a really good guy. What was the inspiration for going to China? Was that David's idea, and then you were like, "Oh, this is this is a good idea," or what sort of led to going to China? You know, you go there, you walk the streets, you just hang out with people. Uh, I was kind of, you know, ex- doing language exchanges with people in Beijing. David was taking classes. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, we both saw it as being really good for our careers, and uh, that was the big drive. When David and I were contemplating rooming um, in China together, you know, by the end of the semester um, in 2003, December, it was very clear. Like, you know, we both were like friends. It was very clear we had, we got along really well and thought, like, dude, let's let's do this thing. Like, hey, you want to go to China? You know, yeah, I'll go to China. So he really. He, he was the person, I think, who really masterminded the whole thing and just because he's adventurous, you know. And for me, I was like, yeah, I'll go along, whatever. I wanted to go back really bad. I'd been there before and uh, missed it. And so one of the things that we mentioned as part of this tri- trip to China would be like, OK, let's stay in Beijing for a little while. And then near the end of our trip, let's make a circuit around China. The plan was that David and George would travel 27 hours together south by train to Guilin, that Star Wars city that George described earlier. After staying and sightseeing for a few days, the two would part ways. David planned to go backpacking in an area called the Tiger Leaping Gorge, then make his way back to Beijing for his belongings, and then meet with his older brother Michael in South Korea. George, who had since parted ways with David, planned to meet up with his friends in a different Chinese province. However, both planned on being back in Utah and attending BYU. George discussed with me their plans. Let's hit this city and this city and this city. Um, He had his plan to meet back up with his brother in Korea, and I had my plan to go home um, and go back to BYU to begin a master's degree. And I, I had, you know, because I'd lived in China before I lived in Shandong province and I wanted to go visit some friends there and surprise them. I thought like, Hey man, why don't we do this part of the trip together? And then I need to go back to Shandong. He had no interest in Shandong. It's not like the most glamorous place in China. And, uh, you know, so he, he already wanted to go to Tiger Leaping Gorge. Um, which, of course, plays into this story, you know, pretty, <laughs> like pretty majorly. And then you look uh, and then, you know, he had he wanted to go to Shanghai and he wanted to go to I think he wanted to go to Xi'an. Uh, but the point is, we wanted to do this circuit trip together and go on this excursion. But I had to bail on part of it. And I told him that about a week before um, we were going to actually execute the trip. I said, hey, man, I hate to break it to you, but I'm going to have to kind of, you know, uh, do I'm, I'm going to have to do this part with you and then you split for the rest. After a long train ride, the two make it to Guilin, a gorgeous city in the Guangxi province in China, lined by the lush green karst mountains and intersected by the Li River. It is an idyllic place that does look as though it is straight from a movie. Well, we had this incredible trip. You know, and we spent, I, I can't remember if it was two days, three days, four days, you know, three evenings, I can't remember. But we spent, you know, a few evenings there getting amazing food. Uh, I think that we were able to rent these fully equipped uh, mountain bikes for 25 renminbi a day, which is, you know, nothing. You know, ridiculously cheap. And so we would, uh, you know, we, we rented them and we would go biking all over the place. We, we, um, went down, um, we took a bamboo raft, you know, down the river. Uh, We would jump into the water from the bamboo raft, which, you know, now kind of in retrospect probably wasn't a good idea just because the water's not terribly clean. Uh, you know, but we'd go swimming and uh, swimming in there. It was a total blast. And then that very last, I think it was, uh, it was a Sunday night was our last night there. Uh, we went to one of these sites there where there's a mountain with like a big hole in it. And we hiked up, you know, through there, had a great time, came back, you know, slept. And then um, his plan was to get up in the morning, Monday morning. He got up in the morning. He's like, hey, dude, see you back in Provo. 
And I swear, like, I would not be surprised if those were his exact last words. It's not like I remember exactly what he says, but it was basically like, hey, see you in Provo. You know, hey, dude, see you. That was, that was our tone. And uh, that was it. I was like, okay, hey, you know, have a good time. My, my plan was to take off from the hotel just a, in a few hours later, get some extra, you know, sleep, and then um, get uh, hit the train um, all the way out of Goiling back to, or up to Shandong province. So that was our point of separation the last time we ever saw each other. This is where the two part ways on August 9th. David leaves to travel west towards Tiger Leaping Gorge, 931 miles away from Guilin, and George heads towards North Shandong, a province much closer to Beijing where he needs to collect his stuff. With this goodbye, everything seems set into motion, just as the two had planned. And when he said that to you, what was his attitude? What was his demeanor like? Was he upbeat or did he sound depressed or? It was exactly like you're hearing me over the phone. I, I, the guy was so chill. And the, the, there was, you know, the, it, it's funny because I, I kind of, I, I contemplate my role in this whole thing every once in a while. And I, it comes down to one thing. I really only have one role and that is as character witness. I was very alert to David's mood during this time. And in retrospect, it is very plain and easy, you know, to look back and think like that guy was, he was living in life, you know? And if there's one thing I'm clear about, David was not about to disappear on purpose. You know, he was happy. He was studying for the bar. He was, you know, he was debating with a professor at BYU about his grade, dissatisfied with that because he was, you know, overachiever. But David was driven and not given to extreme moods. Um, like, just just a chill guy. I, I tell you, we never got in an argument. And, you know, w which says a lot about kind of just his demeanor. He's just really relaxed. After David and George part ways... George finishes out his leg of the trip and arrives back in Beijing. It's not too long after he returns to collect his belongings that he realizes he actually needs David's help. This goes back to kind of, in, you know, the, in Beijing, we'd found a connection with whom we could stash our stuff while we went on this trip, you know. So the problem was that I was going to get back to Beijing first. And it hit me, I'm like, oh, well, Dave knows this guy, but I can't even, like, I couldn't even really quite remember. I, I can't even remember the guy's name. I think I probably remembered it then. <laughs> and I, I still, I'm stunned that I was able to find my stuff when I got back to Beijing. But, but when I, when I was on my way back, I started thinking like, ah, oh, dude, you know, David knows this guy, but I can't, how am I going to get a hold of him? And so I was emailing him, you know, I'd stop at the internet cafes along the way on my trip and I'd email him and say, Hey Dave, when you get the chance, can you just send me the address so I can go get my stuff? You know, cause I was going to get back to Beijing and if I couldn't get my stuff, then, you know, I was in a really bad, bad shape. So I just emailed him and, uh, and then he just never responded. And initially I kind of was just like, Oh, Dave's just being Dave. Like he's off doing his adventure and I don't know what kind of access he has to the internet. And I was able to, you know, ultimately on my own, I was at this point, like my last, you know, like I was, I, I never even suspected, never for a second that something bad had happened. All I thought was like, dude, Dave, get with it, <laughs> you know, send me the address. So I was able through other channels to find out because I had other connections to the same guy. I was able through other channels to find my stuff, get it, go. And when I went and I got my stuff, David's stuff was still there. You know, so I just thought, okay, whatever, you know, so I went home, I flew home, um, a couple weeks after we split and I thought he was still on this tour and about to come back by the time I flew home. It wasn't until George arrived home that he found out that David was not simply off adventuring around China, but that something was seriously wrong. I got home and the day after I got home, I got a call from David's mom. And she says, have you seen, have you seen David? 
And that was it. That was the moment. Like that was the, it was the worst moment. One of the worst moments of my life right there. What went through your head at that time? I, I just knew. I, I, I didn't know what to think. I, I just knew that whatever would happen to David, it was totally out of his control and it was not what we were expecting. I, and it scared the, the living daylights out of me. The last time anyone ever heard from David Snedden was August 11th, 2004. David emailed his mother, Kathleen, the following, quote, I won't go into detail since I plan to write a much longer, detailed email to everyone about this. I'm in Lijong now in western Yunnan province. I will take a bus to hike Tiger Leaping Gorge in about half an hour. I'm having a great time here, but nonetheless am excited to come home. End quote. It broke my heart at the same time because I was talking to his mom. And I just felt like, holy cow. You know, I didn't know what to tell her. I said, you know, Dave and I, you know, I, I saw your son two, three weeks ago. I can't remember what it would have been by then. But, you know, and and uh, yeah, he had, he, you know, I thought he had everything worked out. And she said, you know, uh, well, he was supposed to meet my, you know, my other son at the airport in Seoul, Korea. And he didn't show up. And I think that she had kind of had the same experience that, you know, she had been emailing him and that he was just being silent and then just thinking, oh, well, you know, we'll just we'll catch him at the airport. And, you know, I, it, again, I think that her attitude was probably much the same as mine because she knew Dave. David was supposed to meet his brother, Michael, in Seoul, South Korea, on August 26th. After unanswered emails and unease, Missing the meeting with his brother was the moment when David became a missing person. His family alerted the U.S. Embassy in Beijing, and an international search effort for David began. We were lucky enough to speak with James Snedden, David's brother, who, along with other members of his family, have been a driving force in this investigation. How was it that your family found out? Well, you know, it started with the, the lack of communication. And then, um, so that would alerted mom and she became concerned. He had a commitment to meet my older brother, Michael, in Seoul, Korea, um, I think a week and a half or two weeks after his last communication. So he would have gone through his trek experience and come back out and flown out of Kumin and, and gone to, uh, to Seoul. And, and when my brother went to Seoul, assuming they would still meet as had been planned. He had purchased tickets, and uh, my David had purchased tickets and whatnot, and he didn't show up. That's when we knew that something was wrong, and, and that's when we really got heavy with um, the State Department and the consulate and said, hey, there's a problem. He's missing. He didn't show up for this appointment in Seoul. Um, you know, help us understand what could, what could have happened. Bank records show that David's last activity was on August 5, 2004, when he withdrew 300 U.S. dollars from his bank account. This was the same day that David and George left Beijing, so it makes sense that this would be traveling money. Chinese police and investigators urged by the U.S. Embassy began their search while the Snedens, home in the U.S., eagerly awaited answers. And what was your response from them? Well, I think the response you know, was, it's always been generally helpful without much substance. Um, I mean, they, you know, they, they did some queries and, and I think they got some level of boots on the ground, if you will. But mostly, I mean, he was missing. They hadn't, there was nothing to go on. You know, we, we said, he, here's the last time we heard him. He was in the city. Here's some emails. We kind of were left in the dark. One of the biggest initial clues was David's backpack, left inside a hostel called Jane's Guest House in a city called Shoto. Shoto is a city around two and a half hours south of Tiger Leaping Gorge and is the beginning of what is called the High Trail for trekkers hiking to the gorge. All of these locations are in the Yunnan province in China, which is in the south and borders Burma, Laos, and Vietnam. As a side note, a large portion of the additional information read here today is provided by David's family in what they call an executive report on David's disappearance. 
This huge dossier of well-sourced information is available online for anyone to download and read through on the family's website, www.helpfinddavid.com. You can also find links on our website. The backpack they discovered was David's large traveling backpack. He had a smaller fanny pack that he would use when hiking. This, the smaller pack, was gone. According to the executive report, the backpack David left behind contained clothing, undeveloped film, and airline tickets. The evidence collected from his backpack made Chinese and American authorities at the U.S. Embassy believe that David intended to go hiking in the gorge and then return for his belongings. And since he did not return, they came to a conclusion that David must have somehow died while hiking in the Tiger Leaping Gorge, postulating that he lost his way and fell into the river below. George thought this too when he first heard about his friend. That when you talked to his mom and she shared this with you, did you have any sort of initial suspicions about what might have happened? Was there anything that ran through your head right away about what could have possibly happened to David? I think it was so surreal that the only thing I could think of at that moment was like, he must have died somehow. But it didn't make sense. It just felt like, it, you know, I, I felt like that could be the only thing that could really make sense at that point. But I, at the same time, it, it's not like I felt like David must be dead. And yet, you know, like, you know, I, I, I just didn't know what to think in a lot of ways. But David's family did not accept this conclusion, and this is when they decided to take matters into their own hands and to travel to China themselves to conduct their own investigation and retrace his steps by going to China and seeing for themselves David's last known whereabouts. How long after that was it that you and Michael went back to China to do your own research? Michael and I were just like thinking about the situation. What can we do? How can we exercise pressure? How can we, you know, if China swallowed them, is there anything we can even do? Are they, are they going to be responsive? Did someone kidnap them? We were just going through a jillion scenarios and, and kind of decided to cowboy it. I remember I, I, I said to my brother, I said, you know, we should just go to China and see if we can find him. And he's like, yeah, <laughs> let's do it. And, and then suddenly we're like, Okay, yeah, let's do this, you know. And and uh, then my dad got involved, but we essentially pulled it off. And we were on planes. I think that next Friday, like you know, four days later, to China. Though it took some doing to get all their visas and arranged flights, they, James, his other brother Michael, the same brother David was supposed to meet in Seoul, and their father Roy arrived at Kunming International Airport in southern China on September 10th, one month after they think David left his backpack and set out on the trail. I mean, what is the first thing that you guys do when you get there? We kind of set out our, our plan. I mean, we had no idea really what to do. We honestly played it day by day. We did not know where to go. We did not know what to do. And every day we spent time... Um, pondering and meditating and, and praying and getting together as, as the three of us and, and praying and deciding what to do. <clears throat> and so we, we started with some of the obvious things. We went to the last city where he was uh, heard of, Lijiang, and we walked around. And we, we took a snapshot of his student ID badge. That was the last known picture of him. And we created kind of a placard we, wrote, we wore on our bodies. And walked around the city just hoping that someone would say, yeah, I saw him or whatnot. Um, and that's kind of how we started. We did that for a couple of days as we got some provisions and kind of made some plans and learned a little more about the terrain and who could help us and, you know, things like that. We did manage to secure a translator through the network of our church, and he was more than willing to come and help us, and, and so he spoke Chinese. It just was a day-by-day -day Okay, this is what we learned. Where do we go tomorrow? Let's think about it. Let's pray about it. Let's meditate and, and make the decision pretty much in the morning before we depart. Can you tell me a little bit about your experience on the trail, what the terrain was like, and sort of what you discovered during that process? That was actually one of the key things we wanted to do is walk the trail and see how treacherous it was or, or how treacherous it was not. 
Um, we didn't know. We were told that it was, you know, extremely treacherous and that he probably fell down into the river, into the gorge, and, you know, was swept away. And that's, that's the theory that the Chinese maintain to this day. Maybe for context, it's important to understand that our family has a tradition of backpacking. We had spent many weeks in the summer backpacking the mountains of Wyoming, which are fairly rugged, uh, quite high altitude. David was an experienced hiker. He was a Boy Scout. He was an Eagle Scout. He's very capable in the outdoors. And so I think all of us had that aptitude and going for this hike through the gorge did not really concern us, but we wanted to see it for ourselves. According to James, what they found on this trail was not quite the death trap many thought it might be for someone like David, who, as James said and George reiterated, is an experienced hiker hiking for 16 years before he made this trip. In the next clip, you'll hear James mention the PSB, and this stands for the Public Safety Bureau, which is basically the local police. I think the couple of the key things that we learned, you know, right away, going up the trail, there are um, lodges all the way along the path where foreigners would stay and get food and cold, you know, bottles of water and a cold Coke or a soda or a cold beer, you know. So there is uh, people moving product and, and support throughout the area. Um, one of the first things I remember noticing going up was school children walking around and coming down. Uh, the trails are widely used and widely accessed by the tribal people, and they're, they're, they're traveled regularly, so it's, it's not really an out-of-the-way kind of place. Many areas of the trail actually were wide enough and had, you know, uh, travel marks from vehicles or 4x4s. In fact, when we first started up day one, I don't know how far we had been walking, the local PSB was coming back the opposite direction with their Jeep and dogs. And, and this was, you know, more than three weeks after David had gone missing. <clears throat> they had bloodhounds there, mostly, I think, for show, saying, yeah, we're looking, we're looking, you know trying to sniff up what they could find, though the scent is long, long gone. But you, you just see the evidence that these are widely traveled. More things began to emerge throughout the course of the Snedden's journey. The U.S. Embassy developed the film found in David's backpack and discovered pictures of David and George and of landscapes and scenery. These photos helped his family determine what David carried with him on his final trek. Things like clothing, the Book of Mormon, toothpaste, and a Lonely Planet China guide. The Snedens continued their journey on the trail. Maybe some other important things to note about the terrain. Probably the most treacherous part was an area I think called the Five Bends or the Seven Bends or something like that. It was a, it was a diagonal uh, approach which was kind of gained a lot of altitude as you walked up it. But it wasn't dangerous for falling, per se, it was just it, you gained a lot of altitude, and I actually got altitude sick myself. Um, there was, you know, some areas here and there where you have a drop-off. Uh, I wouldn't say cliff, but, you know, steep. And, you know, if someone would fall off that, they would roll down and, and worst case, you know, be kind of a tree or in rocks or whatnot. But the river itself was you know, miles below the trail. And in fact, there is a road, a highway that is regularly traveled by cars every day between the river and the trail along the whole duration of the, of the trail. So whether you, you were, you know, you're, you're way high in the mountains, the river is miles below you, kind of down, you know, I, when I say miles, some places it's miles, some places maybe a couple miles. But it's way down below with a road in between where you see vehicles moving back and forth here and there. It, it was just, it's not a realistic scenario. A person would have to go to the river and then fall in the river for him to be swept away by the river. For James, the path where his brother could have taken his last steps was an emotional journey. You know, at times, the, the emotions were just very, very um, methodical and intent uh, uh, or full of intention and, you know, focused. 
But um, I'll never forget day two, I believe, where we had come up kind of on a peak area. It may have been considered where the high, you know, the, the top of the gorge, I, I can't recall. But we came out, and there was this beautiful view of these mountain peaks on the other side of the river. And then there's an electric pole kind of off to the side of the trail. By the way, there's electricity to this whole area. And I noticed on the pole, uh, a, they had put a poster picture of David's university ID card shot kind of around that pole and it said, you know, missing trick or whatnot. The, the same picture we'd give him to the, the police to be looking for David. And that scene for me, and, and then I showed it to my brother and my father, um, kind of juxtaposed this pole with David's picture, juxtaposed against these mountains in the background, it, it brought me to tears. It was just, uh, even now it's hard. It was very, very um, hard to look at that and realize this place swallowed my brother and where could he be? When we get back from this short break, we will continue with James on the Sneddon's path through the Tiger Leaping Gorge and the clues they find there. Stay tuned. Blue Apron knows that not all ingredients are created equal. Fresh, high-quality ingredients taste better and are better for you, so it's important to know where your food comes from. For less than $10 per meal, Blue Apron delivers seasonal recipes along with pre-portioned ingredients to make delicious, home-cooked meals. If you head over to blueapron.com slash thinair, you can check out next week's Stellar Menu, which has something for everyone in the family, including caramelized onion grilled cheese sandwiches with summer squash and celery salsa, seared steaks with salsa verde, and crispy catfish with spicy vegetable curry. Blue Apron is bringing you the best. Thanks again to Blue Apron for supporting Thin Air Podcast. Go check out this week's menu for yourself and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash thin air. The specifics and logistics of this trail and trek are too technical and in-depth to go into here. I would highly recommend reading the Sneddon's executive report for more information, including maps and pictures of this specific trail and all the things they experienced on their journey. What they did find is easy to explain. Many people saw David on his journey through the gorge at many different times, which makes sense, according to George. The kid, as I said, he sticks out like a sore thumb. He's a, you know, not too tall American with, you know, receding hairline. So he's, you know, he's white in China and he speaks Mandarin and he speaks fluent Korean and he has braces, you know. So, so here's a guy who's just intrinsically to the Chinese interesting. James explained to me some of the sightings and interactions people had with David inside the gorge. The first mark, I forget what it's called, you have it for, it's sighting, I'll call it sighting one. It was day one, and we had been hiking up the trail, you know, maybe two or three hours, I don't recall ex exactly. Um, as we are coming down the trail, a man leading uh, some horses, uh, a tour guide, I guess is the best way to call him, was coming back down to Shoto, which is the village where they launched a lot of these treks. Um, we had another gentleman that was helping us, a guide, his name is Sean. There's a whole other very interesting story how we found him, but he spoke English and spoke the local dialects, a couple local dialects. Um, he and this, this gentleman started talking, and we stopped and just, you know, they were talking in a different language, so we just kind of were waiting. It turns out that this man, um, Sean called him kind of his cousin, kind of his brother. They were really close, and they, they talked very openly. 
And Sean said, oh, you know, oh, by the way, you know, what are you doing? We're looking for this guy. And, and, and the guy looked at the picture and, and immediately said, oh, yeah, I remember him. He, he joined one of my caravans with us up, up the mountain and was talking in Chinese with a couple. And, and they, did, they, they decided to, to exchange language lessons. He was teaching them English and they were teaching him Chinese. And he walked with our, our group all the way to Tina's guest house, and that's where he stayed. The Sneddons had a specific process when questioning anyone who claimed to have seen David. They asked a series of questions relating to David's appearance, clothing, personal characteristics, and timing to ensure that the reported sighting was credible. They then rated each sighting, of which there are a total of nine, on a credibility scale of one through ten calling this a, quote, rating of authenticity. It really points to the conscientiousness and care that the Sneddons took in their investigation. It's clear that they wanted to be thorough and took great care to do so. But by far, the most sightings of David happen outside of the gorge in a city called Shangri-La. It's a refuge for those who finish the trail, and there are six highly credible sightings of him there. The first, outside of the gorge, is a place called Tina's Guest House. Haba, the city that James mentions here, is between the gorge and Shangri-La. So we had, from our perspective, confirmed very quickly that, uh, that David made it out of the gorge. That's an important notation there, because Tina's Guest House is right out of the gorge, meaning you come out, you, you actually walk down out of the hillside, and it becomes kind of a plain, open area, and there's a road right there where trekkers often can pick up a cab or a bus or a truck and take them on into uh, Haba or uh, Shawila, their final destination. So that's the last of the hiking portion. The river is, you know, closer to Tina's guest house. Uh, and once you make it there, you're, you would be out of any, you know, quote unquote danger of the hike. So he ended up staying at Tina's guest house. According to the guide, that's where he stayed, correct. So what would be the actually like the last sighting of David? Well, the last sighting would be all the way in uh, Shangri-La. We we followed we we continued to follow sightings through the area, and it led us to Shangri-La, um, where we had multiple very strong sightings, and, and those were the last places he was seen. So we decided just to go directly there and see what we could find, and that's what we did. We went there, and, and the first day in, off the bus, walked around all day long, and got zero sightings whatsoever. We were kind of just walking, looking for a barber shop, and we stopped in hotels and guest houses, and other places that maybe a foreigner would frequent and didn't have any any luck. So we turned it in that night, and I was, I in particular was quite uh, frustrated, uh, despondent, and we decided to attack it the next day. The next day, we decided to go to the old, what was called Old, old Town, where there are more guest houses and a lot of more touristy kind of places to see and and whatnot. And I started looking there, and you know, first part of the morning, probably till ten or eleven, we again had no luck. And by this point, I was becoming extremely discouraged. So my father and, 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 you know, we were tired. I was tired. I, was, I wanted to get home and be with my family and whatnot. And so my father and, and my older brother started going up this hill to start asking more guest houses. And I just kind of said, you know, I'm going to sit here for a minute and take a breather. And I sat on some steps um, in front of some building. I forget what it was. <clears throat> and as I was sitting there kind of resting, lamenting, wondering, you know, how the heck, what are we going to do now? We don't have any more information. Um, I looked across the street and there was this this um, Korean cafe called Yak Bar. And I kind of looked at it and I thought, interesting, Korean cafe. And I was like, you know, I said, I bet money David went to that cafe. So I, I got up and I walked across the street and I knocked on the door and no one answered the door. And I was a little bit like, oh, that sucks. So I, I started walking down the stairs and I had this feeling to go back. And I turned around and went right back to the door and knocked again. And I had Charlie, our interpreter, with me. Um, and this time, someone answered the door. So Charlie started asking the woman in Chinese and, and whatnot. And, and uh, 
she was the, the proprietress of, of the location. And she very quickly recognized the picture and, in fact, was added about how David was there three times. He ate there, you know, and had a couple of meals. He came by and, and said goodbye on his way out. And I remember she got this look on her face when we were kind of interviewing her detail, just almost of excitement. You know, I, I could tell that she knew him and probably but liked him a little bit. He spoke Korean. She probably had fun speaking with this Westerner. She was a Korean woman, actually. Um, and there was, there was a clear connection of sorts. And she spoke about him just openly and smiley and talked in great detail about how she interacted with him. Um, so that was a very strong side. And then we kind of did some more effort in that part of town with other locations. We kind of focused, if you will, on some other guest houses and, and, uh, and uh, some tourist locations and found, I think, three to five more sightings in that part of town and, and knew that he had been there. According to the authenticity rating metrics set by the Sneddons, this woman, named Miss Zhang So Fen, the owner of the Yak Bar, was highly credible. She stated that David visited the Yak Bar on three occasions between August 13th and August 14th. To quote the executive report here, she and David conversed with each other in Korean. Miss Zhang's detailed description of David's appearance and personality was phenomenal. She described his mannerisms in detail and how he joked with her and her employees. Miss Zhang reported that on the second day David came and ate around lunchtime. He then told Miss Zhang goodbye, as in, goodbye, I am leaving. Miss Zhang concluded that David was leaving the city, end quote. He was also seen by another employee and the owner of a neighboring shop. The timing of the sighting at the Yak Bar is of particular importance because Miss Zhang told the Sneddons that it seemed apparent that David was leaving the city on the afternoon of August 14th. The Sneddons, knowing the timing of David's return flights from the Yunnan province, theorized that the timing of the sighting fits perfectly with the bus schedules getting him back to his belongings. The executive report notes that the bus terminal was less than two kilometers away from the Akbar, and that leaving on that afternoon to catch a bus would put David right where he needed to be. Based upon the time that he had to be on a plane and the time we think he started on this trek, he probably only had an option to take a bus back home or he went missing in the city. And so because, you know, the, the sightings kind of stopped in that area and because we really had no strong sightings in Li Zhang where he sent the email, we decided that that was kind of the end of the trail, that he just either went missing there or... You know, he probably was going to take a bus back back around to uh, where he started and, and go back to the airport. So that's what we, what we, we concluded. You know, we, we, he, he's, the trail stopped here, and, and we decided there's not much more we can do. And we set out to go to town to find him. You know, we did check hospitals and other places like that to see if he had been had needed care or had been hurt. There was nothing. None of the police folks had any sightings. So all those... Entities who we did party with, by the way, through this period of time, there was there was no evidence of anything, and so we decided that at this point we determined he made it to the gorge. We had enough evidence to take back to the State Department or to the PS, the Chinese PSP, that could substantiate. Hey, he didn't die in the river. He didn't die in the gorge. Now we need to figure out what really happened here. Also relevant is that after this, August 14th, there is no further sightings of David. He's not seen returning to the gorge. He's not seen in the gorge. Shangri-La is the last place David was ever seen, and the Sneddons faced a heartbreaking reality. What was the deciding point that we got to go home now, or, or how did you guys come to that decision? Yeah, that, that's a really hard one to answer, and it's a little bit emotional, I suppose. Um, I guess the best way to describe it is when the trail went cold. We were there for maybe two and a half weeks. 
Based on all their investigation, the Sneddons believe that there is no evidence that points to a return trip through the gorge, but to a bus back to Shoto, the city with his belongings. If David made it through the gorge to Shangri-La the first time, and never returned to the gorge to make his way back, then, for both James and George, the answer is simple. David did not die in the gorge, as suspected by Chinese and U.S. officials. The theory was that, well, maybe he went hiking and he, you know, died on the way back or went, you know, got lost on the way back or something like that. But the the timing, there was a way to take a bus from the end of the gorge back to where, um, you know, David started. And the timing was such that that would have been the most obvious thing for David to have done rather than to have attempted the gorge which would have made him miss his next kind of uh, transportation. I try very hard to follow the evidence where the evidence goes and not to jump to wild conclusions. And, you know, I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm willing to believe that David went back and somehow died in the gorge. I'm willing to believe that. But I just don't think that that's where the evidence points. You know, one, it would have been highly careless, you know, uh, and, and two, he saw too many people and he sticks out like a sore thumb. Yeah, and no one saw him go back into the gorge. Well, I mean, all we knew is that we, we substantiated he went to the gorge. He had witnesses that saw him in Shangri-La and then that's the last we know. His passport has never been used. The Chinese government said his, his passport's never crossed our border. He has a bank account with money that's never had a withdrawal from it. Um, there was never a body found. There was never any artifacts found from what he had on his person. His backpack that he left behind in the guest house, it was all there. Everything he owned, except the fanny pack, which is the top of the backpack and some personal effects that were in there, and his body, all that's missing. It's just gone. Where do you where do you hide a body? Where do you hide personal effects? Where do you where you know? There's just no evidence of anything anywhere. He's disappeared. He is vanished. If you had all this evidence that you were able to collect with your brother and your dad, why does it remain China's official story that David fell into the river? That's a million dollar question. I mean, honestly, I can speculate for you. There's no value, there's no benefit, there's nothing but bad consequence that would come from admitting something other than the official line. And there's no reason to do other than that. I mean, he's missing. Well, what, what, what are you going to do? He's, this is the middle of nowhere China. Well, sorry, he's missing. We did our best. You know, it was the same, the same PSB bureau chief uh, that came down the trail like three weeks after, with bloodhounds, putting on a show for us, saying, we're looking, we're still looking. See, we have a dog. He's sniffing for us. You know, and we just laughed, because I think human scent has gone two or three days after the fact. Uh, you know, so it was, it was a show. We're not, we're not that stupid, but I guess they wanted to put on a good case. So if David didn't die in the gorge... What happened to him? For George, there are three possibilities. I look at it this way. You've got three different possibilities. David died. Two, David said, to heck with life, I'm going to run off, uh, you know, run off with a Korean woman or a Chinese woman. And I'm going to make a new life here. And, and the third is, I'm going to be taken somewhere forcefully against my will. So on the die one, uh, Tiger Leaping Gorge, his brother and his, uh, you know, his brothers and father went and hiked that thing and said, this thing's cake. You know, and David was, you know, from Nebraska, went hiking all the time in Utah. The guy was very tough. The, that didn't happen. Uh, though, you know, again, that's probably the most open theory where, you know, maybe it could have happened, but there is no body. So there's no evidence that David died. Uh, number two, did he, and this is number two is the one where I feel like I have the strongest ground on which to speak on. 
And that is, did David choose to disappear? And anytime I hear that theory, I'm just like, oh my goodness. And the people who spread this theory, they never want to talk to me. You'd have to be a real doofus to believe that David disappeared on his own. The kid was studying for the bar um, and he loved his family. He talked about his little sister, Jenny, and just, you know, how excited he was to get home. Uh, he loved American food. Every once in a while would complain about like, oh, dude, you know how much I would love a hamburger. Uh, he brought his street hockey stuff with him. Uh, he was arguing about his grades with his professors, which meant he cared about, you know, his academic success. Like, if you think that David disappeared of his own free will, that is just stark raving mad nuts dumb stark raving mad nuts dumb or not some consider this an option that david took off to start a new life leaving his family and old life behind and according to george he didn't seem off or despondent in any way and he told his family he was excited to return and see them so running off really doesn't seem like a plausible explanation. The Snedden family agrees. The family kind of finds that theory comical because we saw the intent. And I think the other reason it's comical is uh, when we did that trek in western China, Yunnan province specifically, the police that we were working with, the Chinese police, the PSB, they, they said point blank on a couple occasions, you know, a, a westerner, cannot go missing in this part of the country. It, it's just impossible. They would not be able to go undercover and hide because there's, there's just not any of them out here. So that David couldn't do that. He just couldn't go and run and hide and, and, and start a new life. It's, it would be impossible. So really, you're just left with those two, those two choices. One is death. The other one is abduction. You know? And if you don't show me the body, then everything that they're saying about abduction sounds pretty dang reasonable. The third option, foul play, some person or persons abducting or killing David. But who would want to hurt David? George described to us that, before heading out on the trip, he never felt worried about this possibility. And I think at the time that, you know, I kind of thought, you know, I thought to myself, yeah, I probably shouldn't travel in China alone. But, you know, if you're only in Beijing, and with the amount of time that we, I had been in China before, you, uh, particularly as an American, you feel very safe. The Chinese, they're looking out for you. You know, with, with a population of 1.3 billion, there's not a lot of places you can go for solace anyhow. And so it, it kind of gives you this complacent feeling like, you know, what, what can really go wrong here? You know, and I, and I kind of always had the feeling like, look, if they did anything to an American, they'd be in so much trouble. The U.S. State Department agrees with this assertion that travel to China is very safe and violent crime involving foreigners is not very common. The three returned home with these new sightings, with renewed hope that David had not died in the gorge. But they were left with more questions than answers. In response to all the evidence they found in China, the Snedens compiled their findings into their executive report and sent it to the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the U.S. Department of State. In the cover letter, they assert four key points, which are 1. David Snedden traveled safely through Tiger Leaping Gorge. 2. Multiple witnesses encountered David between August 11th and 14th and positively established that he left the gorge and traveled to Shangri-La. 3. David was last seen in Shangri-La around noon on Saturday, August 14th, 2004. And 4. David is missing involuntarily, perhaps kidnapped or kept against his will by some persons or organization. And this is how the family lived for seven years, knowing that whatever happened to David, it did not happen the way that Chinese and American officials said it did. In 
In April of 2011, a man named Chuck Downs called Roy and Kathleen Sneddon on the phone. And since then, the story of what happened to David Sneddon has never been the same. We were approached by a gentleman named Chuck Downs who first broached the subject and said, hey, you know, I got your executive report. Here's how I got it. Again, that's another very interesting story. Said, we, we think he may have been kidnapped in North Korea. And they were like, wow, really? Uh, I mean, I think a lot of us were maybe, it was a little incredulous, right? And I, I think there's a number of the family that were like, really? Are you sure? Come on now. And, you know, as we, as we dug and learned more, it, it began to gain steam and credibility. And we learned the history. We learned the evidence of the previous kidnappings. We learned about, and we tied it to the type of David's missing person. And it, it, was, it was very stereotypical. It, it fit very cleanly with all the other types of missing person cases, especially those that have been verified to be in North Korea. Do you believe that David is alive in North Korea today? No, absolutely. Yeah, that's been confirmed even by uh, other witnesses now. In two weeks on Thin Air, part two of the David Sneddon story, we break down all of the evidence that David Sneddon was kidnapped by North Korea while traveling in the Yunnan province, taken to North Korea against his will, and is alive there today, likely with a wife and children. In part two, we continue our discussion with George and James, and we also talk with the executive director of the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea. We talk to a congressman from Utah's 2nd Congressional District and author Robert Boynton, who has written extensively on individuals kidnapped by North Korea. You won't want to miss it. And the fact that it's coming from independent agencies, you know, <laughs> there's the, the fact that there's so many documents you know, redacted by the U.S. government. Something went down there, you know? <laughs> and so I, I just think that it's, there, there's too much information right now pointing to North Korea for that possibility to be ignored. And you don't have to believe in UFOs, you know, to, to, to you know, eat this stuff up. It's, it's just, it happens. People have been abducted by North Korea. So why not save it? We would like to say thank you to George Bailey and James Sneddon for speaking with us for this week's episode. Check out our website at thinairpodcast.com for more information on David Sneddon's story, including pictures, sources, and links we discussed in today's episode. That's thinairpodcast.com. We also want to plug our brand new Patreon one more time, patreon.com slash thinairpodcast. Our first mini episode, which is a Patreon subscriber exclusive, will be released one week from today, and you won't want to miss it. Music today was provided by Blue Dot Sessions. Check out their website at sessions.blue for more information. We'll be back in two weeks. Mm-hmm.